All right, so I'm going to do a quick intro um, for the session so everyone who's logging in can know, like, what am I even seeing? <laughs> so good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, this is uh, the DNA session number one for the uh, DNA session. What's DNA session? DNA stands for Dialogues for North America three-way conversation between people from each of the three countries, uh, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, um, with the intention of making this citizen diplomacy type of interweaving of a network of people who are involved and committed to making positive change and positive impact in their communities from many different angles, from business and health and policy and all kinds of walks of life. So that's the point of this uh, this type of um, an exercise, these DNA sessions. Uh, these DNA sessions is, an, is a series of eight sessions that is being hosted uh, by the Laurentia Project in partnership with Cala Education from Mexico. And we wanna be exploring different aspects of impact in general, impact entrepreneurship, impact activities, uh, and the way that people can be forces for good and positive transformation in their communities individually in their communities and also as a, in the broader sense of the three countries working together towards a positive future. So today, our very first session on these topics, uh, we wanna ask like the general topic, the question of what does it take to be an impact entrepreneur in North America? And today we have two amazing humans, Emmanuel Cameron and Oliver Sanchez, and I'll leave them to introduce themselves. My name is Luis Martin del Campo. I'm the founder and CEO of Cala Education. Cala Education is a company based in Mexico that is a school for leaders and change makers. Uh, we want to have people remember who they are before the world told them who they should be and then have all the skills and tools they need to be forces for good in their lives, positive transformation in their lives, in their workplace, and in their communities and beyond to be able to build what we call a regenerative culture. So that's Kala. We've worked with uh, 7,000 people over the past four years in four countries, two languages, um, offline, and now we're moving into an online direction. Anyway, that's all about me. Heads off to you. Should, should Why don't you go first, Emmanuel? Okay, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> and thanks, Liz, for, uh, for having us. So. Uh, Nice to meet you uh, guys on the other end of uh, this Zoom call. Um, my name is Emmanuel Cameron. I've been um, the, the, the co-founder of an initiative here that's been taking place about uh, four years ago on the south shore of Montreal. It's actually been the first startup ecosystem um, that, uh, that, that has been growing uh, outside of, uh, of the, the, the Montreal shore. Montreal is our biggest startup ecosystem here in Quebec. Biggest moments of region here uh, in, in the Quebec province. Uh, it's also the second most important economically. Uh, we're having a really strong uh, economic tissue uh, built out of uh, manufacturing, uh, agro, uh, agro food, agro technologies, and uh, uh, TIC. Uh, we're looking at building more places for entrepreneurs where they can feel like uh, they have a sense of community where they can bond with other entrepreneurs, with uh, bigger enterprises, with the social entrepreneurs, with local uh, non-for-profits organizations. So we're, we're kind of a, an ecosystem builder here uh, with uh, multiple co-working places, also uh, multiple uh, ecosystem leaders that we're putting to the uh, we're putting to the test and that we're asking uh, them to be uh, make themselves available for the, the entrepreneurs in the different sectors of um, the, the South Shores and also the, the different places in Montreal. We're here also with the first startup incubator on the South Shore, which name is uh, Le Garage, the Garage and, Com and Company. And we're also having the first living lab named Continuums. So that's what we're all about and we're looking to have a more than a positive impact on the Quebec uh, and also on the, at the, the global scale in order to put forward uh, all the good uh, startups and also all the, the startups who are in the so this impact can uh, uh, go abroad. Thanks for having us. Nice, thank you, Emeril. What about thank you, you Yeah, so hi guys, uh, on the other side of the screen, uh, my name's Oliver Sanchez, I'm Managing Director of Excel Hub. 
so Excel Hub, we started Excel Hub a couple of years ago uh, after seeing how much trouble entrepreneurs from abroad had uh, when trying to launch their companies in the US. Uh, we run several programs focused on innovation, creating innovation bridges between the Boston ecosystem and Latin America. The goal ultimately is for, uh, to help founders and entrepreneurs to raise capital and access the US market. Uh, last year, we hosted you know, approximately 30 different startups from part, different parts of North America. And uh, yeah, we're looking to create this, you know, uh, th this programs and, and, and somehow develop a, an innovation diplomacy, right? Uh, where we can change cultures and impact economies through innovation and entrepreneurship. So pleasure to be here. Amazing. Thank you for being here. So I want to jump right in and uh put out the question that is the topic of the day which is what does it take to be an impact entrepreneur and i think it could be interesting to start with what does impact even mean in our different countries yeah well uh, i'll go first and i'll go quicker than my introduction <laughs> <laughs> I, real, I realize that oliver is, is much better at uh, the, having a, the, the synthesizer out. yeah synthesizing <laughs> So for us, impact, uh, we try to look at all the different uh, sustainable uh, development um, categories of the, the UN, and that's what we're focusing on. We're much more closer to any type of businesses uh, that are looking to have a social impact. So for local communities, uh, for people in the needs. So when you, you say this out loud here, uh, impact entrepreneurship, that's what you have first in mind. But it can go all through the, I think, the 17 different uh, categories of sustainability um, development categories of the UN. So clean tech, uh, making the world a better place for, for everybody else. But first and foremost, uh, thinking about impact entrepreneurship, if you can make a difference for the person right next to you, uh, help them get, get, be in a better position, uh, have a better living, make a better living, then you're going to be classified here as an impact entrepreneur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least, I, at least, Emmanuel, this is something we briefly touched upon in our first when we first met, and and you know, I I, explain, I, I, I think I mentioned to you guys the experience I had working with um, startups from Mexico, in that the Mexican government really wanted us to certify that the startups were impact startups, and it was a concept that it was a little bit foreign to me because in in the U.S., particularly, impact startups. Uh, are seen as, as a socially, you know, social responsible or so, social impact specific, as opposed to economic impact. And so, in that sense, you know, I guess every high growth startup has, it has an impact, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's not how that's not how it's seen here. And, and so, in, in the US, you may have this social impact VCs, social impact, you know, impact uh, specific kind of uh, funding models, as opposed to everything else. So it's a little, it's, it's it was it was definitely eye-opening for me to, to see how, uh, you know, how at least in, at least in Mexico, uh, the startups that we were working with were seen as impact, even though we're not in clean tech, we're not in, you know, anything specific or social responsible, but we're just seen merely as impact because they have a high growth potential. Uh, or you know, at least for, in my current experience, that uh, impact here is seen as, you know, something that has very, very specific social impact and financial returns may, may not come into play all the time. Hmm. That is, that is a really interesting uh, thread that you're like bringing out there, man. Because uh, on the one side, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, any business is an impact business because we're generating right. jobs, we're generating growth. Right. But, but, and this is something that, that comes from this, uh, looking at things from a more holistic perspective and also taking into account like the 17 SDGs is that if you as a company or as an economy, as an entire city or as an entire country, if you only focus on growth in terms of just quantitative growth, then mm -hmm. that may sound like impact, but it's more than likely not because mm -hmm. the way we're currently designing our businesses and our economies is geared towards maximizing economic gain at the expense of social and environmental cost. Okay. So. In, in my perspective, um, this is personally, because I don't know if ever, I don't think everybody in Mexico and I don't think anybody, like all of the people everywhere see it this way, but uh, all companies and all economies should always have these three things in mind, uh, people, planet, and um, 
and profit. profit. Yeah. So that with those things in mind, those three things have to be taken care of. So of course you can't have a profitable or, or you can have a functioning economy if there isn't uh, a way for it to be sustainable economically. But if in the way of finding that economic sustainability, you forget about the environment and, and people, then you're not really profiting at all. Most, some you know, people would even call that like you're actually stealing from the economy or from the context because you're taking more than you're giving back or you're draining the conditions that make business even possible. If I may, here yeah. we're coming from, we're coming really from far back because uh, let's say about five years ago and a bit further back, people were considering uh, impact businesses being just non-for-profits, just being uh, social economy driven companies. Right. Uh, if you were an incorporation, it, we, we would be talking about CSR, corporate social responsibility, if you had anything to do with, with uh, impact, but you, you couldn't be classified, you couldn't be eligible for, for grants, for, for contests, for, for spe specific VCs, if you didn't have that non-for-profit somewhere. So like it, it was a huge disadvantage for a lot of businesses that wanted to make a, a real impact and make a real difference in their local community or, or even elsewhere. And so the government started to change their, their mindset with more and more initiatives and, and, and co-working places, incubators, VCs that were saying, no, no, look, our KPIs chart, that triple, uh, triple um, let's say, bottom line chart that we just mentioned, economy, uh, uh, like... Uh, social responsibility and also uh, being able to have a, a good impact on, on the earth like these things took time to put in place but now we're, we're seeing more and more contests and grants being uh, given given out there and and to businesses that are like inc they, they're there to make profit and that's good but also in their mission at their core you have that uh, impact driven with all these kpis so the, the, it's always being capable of showcasing how you have you're having that impact a bit like B Corp, who were one of the first to instill these uh, these metrics here. Yeah, and another perspective to this: uh, you know, over the last maybe three, four years, there's been a huge emphasis, uh, not only from startups but also like investors that are investing in local start tech startups, on making sure the teams that are formed are diverse, gender diverse, and racially diverse, right? And th this has created a social impact as well. And you know, I'd be curious to see or to hear from you, Luis and Emanuel, if, that's, if you see the same thing happening in Latin and Canada. I had not seen this. You know, I'll tell you a little anecdote. We had uh, some of the startups we had this last year. I think out of the eight that we brought here, eight did not have a single woman in their board or, or the CT or C level suite. Mm. And it was very, it was very, you know, it was very alarming. It was my our bad because we actually didn't we didn't realize it. We, we were kind of blindsided to this. But we were presenting to one a female investor, and you know this female investor, she really rightfully pointed out, you know, you're asking me for money, yet you have not a single woman in your board or your teams, right? And so, I think that that there is this impact. What what impact means, and what social? I think to your point, what what is good for the for for the environment for the society you live in? I think it varies uh, over time. I change over time, but there might be some in immediate factor or some immediate things that we need to focus right away that could help uh, the new local or local societies. I think gender and racial diversity is not something that's spoken a lot in Latin, uh, but it's hugely needed. I don't know, I don't know that much about on, on the Canadian side, but uh, that's just another part of, of, of this impact that, that I think people should take into account when they're starting. For a new sure. Company. For sure. I mean, I, I think the way we do things in general, speaks about and reflects the culture or the mindset of, of a place and its people. So of course it's going to be changing over time. As you say, we're going to ideally be evolving and striving for a higher and more um, like optimizing and tweaking towards better, constantly better. I, I guess the goal um, we have to be aware of the circumstances and the things that are, keeping us from our highest potential as a species or as a community or as a, or as a company. So you pointed out, for example, gender and race. And it's funny because in the, well, it's not funny, but it's interesting. 
Like, yeah. like let's say in, in Latin America, I can only speak for Mexico, but uh, it's interesting how the big conversations here are mostly, at least it feels to me this way, as focusing on we don't speak so much about the race side. Mm -hmm. So even though Mexico, a lot of people a very racist country. It's not something we have top of mind. It's not something that is very close to us in our history because we're not very conscious about the racism that is in our culture, but we're very that is a conversation that I have heard in, in the entrepreneurship circles where they're mm -hmm. saying, as you said, we need more women in the companies. We need more women leaders. And uh, I have some the impact investment field that is pointing to how companies that are guided, driven, directed, founded, uh, or as counseled by primarily women tend to be more uh, profitable, tend to perform better, and tend to have better uh, environment within the company. So it's mm -hmm. a really interesting statement. Yeah, but, but things over here are, are moving, moving quite fast. There's been so many really great initiatives that uh, are proven to be effective right now. Uh, a lot of funding that are, are being given out there about banks and also VCs that are asking for up 25 to 50 percent of the of the control of a company that that is uh, uh, in the hands of, of women. And so, it do we actually these um, these conditions, these prerequisites to make sure that things are moving? I, I say that. For the time being, since uh, there's such a, a huge disparity between companies that are by men, I think it, it's needed right now. In a way, maybe going to be a 50 or 40, 60, um, you know, uh, disparity level. But if we don't take it into consideration now, if we we're not proactive about it, if we if we don't discuss it openly, if we don't have this group, having so many groups like uh, women in tech. Uh, I mean, it's great because you have as many men, as many women participating to these groups. At the end of the day, um, the word that is buzzing out there is that, hey, uh, technologies, uh, engineering, um, uh, launching companies, it's all, it's all up for grass for women as much as for men. And so I don't think it's done against, uh, against the, the, the male gender. It's more to promote women. And we're, we're starting to see it uh, come to fruition and there's more and more companies. I think um, here in Quebec, the level is a bit higher of companies that are uh, led by women, but it, we're still like at a 20% rate, it's, it's, or even a bit uh, lower than that. So, so still not there at all, but at least we're, we're, we're going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, we're moving in the right direction. And uh, I want to touch back on real quick. On, you mentioned, for example, the DGs uh, a few minutes ago and uh, how those things are starting to be taken into consideration in, in the building of companies or in the measuring of their impact. Um, from what Emily seems like uh, that is something taken into account often in Canada. I know that I'm here in Mexico, uh, both from the global compact companies, the big corporations that are looking at the uh, snippet development goals. Uh, I know that more and more social or impact entrepreneurs are looking at those. Uh, people are not just thinking of uh, the business, but also taking into account of my impact. Because the SDGs provide this, um, like a framework. It's like pointing to specific things that we might be interested in changing. Like, oh, life in the sea, or uh, inclusive economic development, or education so it's pointing to specific things that we can look to change in our communities and i was curious to see oliver if that is the case uh, in the u.s as well are you seeing more and more topics or is a is a sdg framework something that not many people are aware of what are you yeah seeing? To, to be honest at least in personal experience i have not seen that framework come up uh, a lot of times i like i said the only times it has come up is when we're I'm in a conversation with people from different countries and they're you know they're talking about how do we achieve some of these goals, how are we align those goals. And it's surprising when you when you pointed out the first conversation because um you know I'm the system, I get you know notification from all kinds of uh, innovation media. 
I don't, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding any mention of these goals in any of this, uh, in this media. Uh, and I, I don't know mm -hmm. if it's a, it's a Boston or necessarily a, a all US thing, but I don't think it's, at least in the ecosystem that I am, as prevalent or as top of mind as maybe abroad or in different parts of the world. Hmm. And the, would you say the ecosystem in Merced is more tech entrepreneurship, traditional entrepreneurship, or do you would you say that it's also people concerned with making positive impact? Yeah, you know, it, there's uh, obviously Boston is huge, huge health. There's a there's a you know a huge um, health innovation and health tech uh, uh, ecosystem. So there's always there's always talk about you know saving lives, and so that's always top of mind i just don't think that you want like the people said about the u.n necessarily trickle down to, to this level so i think i think this is this might be a later conversation but this it might be the way uh, the ecosystem had developed which is developed based on research based uh companies you know this is usually students from mit harvard or local there's like over 80 universities in boston that the research they, 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 they generate, they turn into companies and the companies turn into these big startups. Uh, and I don't necessarily see a huge kind of government uh, push on what this focus of innovation should be. It's more uh, based on the research and the companies that are in the ecosystem. That's where the, where the push to, the, to innovate comes from. Uh, and so I think this kind of UN directive. So, what you're saying you know, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. what, what's that? I'm sorry, sorry, I was, I was interrupting, uh, but uh, what, what you were saying pointed to something that I think is really interesting as a way to start weaving the impact narrative or this, this division of the fact that your work has in the world uh, by starting to have a conversation with that ecosystem about, for example, the SDG framework. So here's, here's the, the line of thought. So you're a tech company that's focusing on health and maybe you're engineers, you're scientists and you're focused on let's get the most uh, advanced and most uh, human life saving uh, technology out there. That is amazing. Mm. And if you started thinking in terms of also like just connecting to the framework that, oh, there's different elements uh, that can point to having a clear reporting, for example, of the type of work that we're doing and how it's, then those companies could start on the one side thinking of themselves as impact businesses because they are seeing more transparently what kind of positive impact they're having. And also it can remind towards what kinds of uh, adjacent or alliances or niches in the market that they can be targeting just by broadening their spectrum towards thinking, oh, if I'm doing stuff, then thinking in systems that can have a on, let's say, uh, the food industry, the education industry. How am I impacting these other things? And so that starts to shift the conversation. And some of the things that I've been seeing in, in Mexico, for example, and maybe point to this with the B Corp example is more and more companies are reframing the way they measure success and so considering like oh yes my uh, well-being but also look at these things and how my day-to-day -day activities are making uh, a positive impact so, anyway just thoughts on how thinking differently of how you measure For us up. <laughs> yeah. So we'll keep there the discussion go. going, Oliver. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you froze up a little bit, Luis. I don't know. We didn't catch the last piece. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. I hope. Yeah. I hope the, the the other the first bit was there. Yeah. Uh, I think we missed the best piece. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you were to sum things up. Like, what would be the, the key takeaway of uh, everything you've just said? So, like, for the purpose of the audience, so we, we get the, the yeah. picture. I think the key takeaway is that if you start a conversation in your company, 
into also including these terms of, uh, let's say, the SDGs, it can broaden the, the, and the way you speak about your business to the public, which will make you go from business as usual to a business that has a purpose or a business that is making positive impact in a measurable way. And that can change both your profit, but also it can change um, your opportunities for being funded, for example. But if I may, um, one thing I wanted to, to bring before, and I think it's, it's linked to what you've just mentioned, is for us here, um, we, we received about two years ago, I think the National Summit of um, Canadian Angels. And we had a discussion about the diversity uh, on, on boards uh, of startups. And they were saying, instead of uh, putting out there like uh, more like strict rulings about if you want to be funded by us, you need to have uh, women or the, any type of, uh, of, um, of uh, like, uh, like somebody from a different uh, cultural background, somebody coming from a, a different economic background. Like instead of imposing these measures, it's more about when you do your campaigning to recruit startups, to recruit big businesses, putting out their uh, references, uh, models of people who are integrating all these, these, um, these different people's businesses that have succeeded with these different type of models, with these different uh, ways of, of being measured, not only in profit, but also in impact or in, in, in it, it was about like, if we're advertise, advertising and showcasing more businesses that have these different faces out there, uh, representing the diversity of, of, of real entrepreneurship that's happening, uh, we're going to be uh, leveraging more than just having all these grant funding that are there to uh, um, assist. Yeah, well, yeah. And these fundings, I don't, I don't want to say we don't need them, but in a way, they're they're giving you a, an incentive to change the way you're proceeding. So you're not really changing things because you have a mindset about it, but because you want to get that in, uh, financial incentive. So, but if through time and it's effort, so you educate your ecosystem about all these different ways of achieving impact and also achieving economic success. Uh, it's like through time. Well, that's what Techstars uh, mentioned during that, that summit. You, it's, it, we advertise more ads, like I think uh, 60 or 70% of their ads uh, in order to recruit their next startups were showcasing women. And just by doing that, like the level of uh, applications that had women doubled. So, so it, they, they didn't say, oh, we're going to finance you more if, if, if you have women on your board or, or if you have a, a minority or if you have this or that. So in a way, um, um, I think that it's like, it's a, it's a diff different way to look at the, problem than uh, bringing all these types of incentive it's about changing the, the mindset that we really want to see in the in the years to come and um, and, um, and something I wanted to add about Oliver uh, uh, you said that you have a strong uh, med tech uh, ecosystem and I mean you have strong engineering also ecosystem Boston has uh, is famous for a lot of, of different uh, things uh, we're lucky here in Montreal to say that next to Boston we're, we're biggest uh, university city in North America thanks to uh, our um, five universities in the Montreal region but in a way we don't have the same uh, strength in, in med tech as you have in Boston but I know a lot of different projects are looking to create these bridges like you make um, with MIT for med tech uh, with the local uh, challenges that um, the respirators and uh, all the, the the masks and everything. Uh, I think you produce the, a local uh, uh, 3D printing machine in order to help uh, worldwide. There's ways to have impact by trying to emulate what others are doing, but just by trying to add what our special recipe, our special ingredient is locally based so like we can build on all the the, the innovations that are coming and, and, and spawning out of of bus sometimes and looking at all doing the same thing at the same time it's kind of this operation so how do you want to impact if you're all fighting for the same resources for the, to achieve goal together to emphasize that goal and create synergies just wanted to 
take the TV conversation. Uh, wow, you yeah. pointed out some amazing things there, man. I'm just gonna pull my real quick. Just you said, well, you first the importance of mindset. So it's not just about the external incentive, but be coming from a, a commitment or being um, clear that the future we want looks like something that it's not just profit, but it's also taking care of these other areas of life. So you pointed to this. you pointed to the importance of the place. And you were saying about the special recipe from, let's say, Montreal. Taken into account very much because the current mindset of like financial go global, and in the process of thinking about those big scales, uh, it tends to make everything the same, and we forget that every place has a particular set of needs. So to be able to be an impact entrepreneur in North America, we may be needing to think about the contextual needs of each region or each place. So that's that's the second thing that you pointed to, which I was like, yes, this is very important. Three, collaboration. This is something that I've been seeing for many years, how uh, people who want to make positive impact tend to speak about making positive impact and wanting to make good things uh, and togetherness and we, but then in there is often a lot of competition for funding and for the spotlight and for everything else. You mentioned this race for things and put things out there, be the first. So a third thing that I think is key uh, from what you pointed out is the notion of collaboration and cooperation. If we're not collaborating, then we're not getting it that the times we're in now require all of us to work together. So anyway, I just wanted to point to those three things and, uh, and let Oliver continue. No, I was I was pretty much done. I, I think the, the I was just gonna lose you, you that the first point you made in that how different geographies measure or, or or find different impacts relevant. I think that's a key point if you're an entrepreneur as well, because from, from if you're trying to say you're trying to because all entrepreneurs as, as I mentioned are trying to go go to the US, scale globally, right? And so one of the first challenges that they have is that they, they measure impact based on where they come from, right? And so when they come here to the U.S., they come in and say, well, you know, we can impact tequila product, agave production, blah, 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 and we can feed them, you know, do the farmers and help, you know, help com local communities because our technology. And that sounds really good if you're in Mexico and you're like in Guadalajara and you're producing tequila. But if you're in Boston and you, I've never been to a tequila production, I don't care what the guy, guy in agave is growing. They should, but they don't, right? And I think it, it, it speaks to the point that every single geography, every single location has measures impact in a different way and, and measures what's important to them in a different way. And that's very important to, to keep that in mind. And that there's no like, maybe there's some general common things that we can measure as impact, but everybody cares about different things uh, depending where, they, where they're from. And maybe one thing I can add is also the, the difference between let's say urban ecosystems versus uh, like outside of big oh, yeah. cities areas uh, ecosystems. It's, they're not looking to achieve the same goals. Uh, we had a, a summit for um, uh, Quebec's accelerators and uh, incubators. And what, there were 40 different uh, incubators and accelerators. And like most of them, the, the, the earliest one that, that spun out were coming out of the big cities, uh, Quebec City, Montreal, Sherbrooke. And, but like, all the rest of them, which I'm part of, were coming out from, uh, let's say, suburbia or, or even more remote places. And achieve the impact we wanted to have. Yes, it was the first, but it was the economic assets of a particular locality or, 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 or region. And mm -hmm. like, obviously we were, maybe we won't have a unicorn coming out of it like uh, the, the very next day, but we're gonna be having, uh, a, of a lot of new jobs that are going to improve the of that region. And so it's, it, it's normal that there's that push and pull between big cities and, and suburbia and uh, more remote yeah. places. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to achieve the same thing. And, and, it, and when it comes down to collaboration, sometimes it's perceived as, oh, you're putting out all the, the away from this.
because where we are located, it's actually in a suburban region, and we're right, like in a sandwich between <laughs> Montreal and more. Just so, like leverage the big cities that are near you uh, for for sometimes. Uh, And in a way, it's it's more about what can I get from working alongside uh, other region and more urban region, and what is really my like let's say my unique value proposition as as a place where I can uh, get more talent and, and money coming my way, and, and, and we're we're having more and more of these um, of these models right now that are being produced thanks to uh, technologies that are and thanks to COVID. People are working wherever they are right now, and yeah. like keep startups keep keep. Going. So there is a demonstration to be made that impact changes by uh, uh, by the by places. Hmm. So maybe it was too long to just say no, that. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. That was it, it. Made me think about a lot of a lot of questions popped in my mind because I was thinking it. Like a question about, so what does it then need? What, what do you need as a person who wants to be an entrepreneur? What do you need to, to, to have in mind? What do you need to, to know to be able to build an entrepreneurship project if you want to make positive impact? Uh, and that made me think, do you need to then maybe move from your place of origin to somewhere else? Or can you stay? If you stay, what do you need? If you leave, what do you need over there? Um, I, Oliver mentioned about the example of the Agave factory and, and the technology and like this excited entrepreneur going to Boston to pitch and he, saying, yes, we're going to save so many jobs in, in Jalisco. And people in Boston going like, I don't even know where that is in the map. Like, yeah, what, what is that's that? Right. That's so right. th that's, that's like making me ask myself, and there may not be, not be an answer for this right now, uh, what things do you need to keep in mind and how do you need to be as an entrepreneur and what are the resources you need as an entrepreneur in these different places um, to thrive, to achieve your goals? And I'm also wondering how, how can we both acknowledge and honor the fact that there's different needs in different places and that different people, let's go with the example of Boston and Jalisco, like the people in Boston have their own interests, their own things that are relevant to them. So how can we build collaboration between this large space where resources can go to where they are most needed to help those local relevant things while acknowledging that each place has different things. Essentially, how can Boston, with their not knowing where Jalisco is, help Jalisco and the agave industry, for example, mm -hmm. even if they don't care about the industry itself because they're not aware of it, like how, how can those interconnected um, networks of mutual help be woven together? Because there's all kinds of people wanting to do good for their communities and a lot of people are having to go to these big hubs of innovation and leave their place uh, to chase the dream of becoming an entrepreneur, to go where the resources are, to go where the connections are. In Mexico, it happens that people have to go to Mexico City, which is a big city of entrepreneurship, or Jalisco, or Monterrey, those are the three big hubs. Uh, and so they, they end up leaving the place that needs them the most. So it's, it, I don't know if they're, but it's a thing that we need to think about. And I, I see exactly an answer, but I see an example potentially could and people you, 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 I find it like the common enough. so Emmanuel mentioned like in, in Montreal I know Montreal is like it's been known recently especially for big AI focus and and uh, around that space so if you're an AI company at that space anywhere else and you want to move to Montreal maybe AI and or whatever that's whatever the, the strong sector is in, in Montreal that's your common denominator if you're a Boston company want to help Jalisco and maybe you're big in biotech, maybe bio, how, how your product in bio can affect the agave production. Maybe that's how you find a common denominator. So I, I think there's, 
there's common denominators that we can help, you know, there, there's like very basic, uh, I would say, uh, I don't know what the right, right word for this, very basic things we can all, we can help each other across the different countries. I think it, you do have to tailor the impact and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the way you present your business to each specific location. But if you can find a common thread or a common technology or a common challenge across the different cities, that's how you realize if you have a global company, right? Is that, you know what, a farmer, if, if I create a buy, some kind of bioproduct that helps agave grow, and it, it could also help, you know, whatever's growing, you know, in, in the case of Massachusetts, maybe apples and, and, um, and cherries and, and uh, whatever, whatever the local produce is. And you know, maybe I go to Montreal and that actually can help. So, so I think there's, if you can find common threads that are meaningful to the local, to the local population, I think that's how you can not only find, it, uh, create a really impactful company, but also you can create a really global company uh, because you're impacting different populations, not only yourselves, but also uh, impacting them in, in, in a way that's me meaningful to them. I 100 or 200 percent agree with her. it's about these threads that I was talking about like I see ourselves us three and everybody who will be watching that video anybody who wants to become a connector actually to become a, con a connector you you can just build awareness about all these possibilities that 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 you know and that you want to share with others just by making a simple introduction, sharing the right information at the right time, uh, keeping yourself well informed also about if, if you're, you're big into ag tech, uh, agro technologies, well, maybe you, you should be as much uh, interested into uh, more traditional means of, of doing agriculture as all the new technologies that maybe have nothing to do with the field of ag technology. So this way you can have, um, uh, new applications, new ways, of, new verticals for, for an actual technologies or help improve a, a really traditional industry with, uh, with new means. So no matter what you do, it's about like getting informed, sharing that information, information and, and having a, a good network that you, you, you take time and effort to, uh, to maintain and also develop. Because I think there's a, a study about, um, I think, if you go higher than 144 people, it's hard for you to like, you cannot list more than 144 people you know. You, at some point you lose track of these people. So it's important to be well organized about like, who's doing what, uh, how, how easy it is for you to maybe take the time to share uh, these, these, these people with your network. It's also a great way to build your, your, um, your, your sympathy capital, making sure that people get to know you and that you're, you're somebody that, that's uh, generous about his network. So for me, just the extent of what Oliver is saying is global awareness will come through not just like us, our organizations, uh, it, it comes from like all the, the simple gestures that people can, can do every day. Like I've learned something great. I've talked with somebody awesome. You should think about sharing uh, these, these tips with your, your, uh, with your network. Uh, this you know, is the best way to improve. You know, I know, yeah, I was thinking about a, uh, an anecdote I had. I remember talking to a woman in Israel and she was in charge of an Israel accelerator that was set up, I think, by the government of Israel after that book, Startup Nation, came up. And, you know, and I was asking her about her goals and she said, you know, well, Israelis are really good at innovating. You know, we're great at, at uh, cyber, cyber security, ag tech, and all these things that are born out of the Israeli problems, right? But we need to find non-Israeli problems to solve. And it, it made me think, so I was like, wow, it blew my mind. Cause like, that's exactly <laughs> what it. we need, right? Uh, we should all be sharing, not only solutions, we should actually be sharing problems. Because if you're, if you're an entrepreneur in Mexico, in Guadalajara, thinking solving the tequila problem is the best big thing, and then somebody, you know, you know, Emmanuel comes out like, you know what, that's great, but I have this massive problem around corn or around, you know, whatever. And then you're like, what? Corn is a bigger problem? You know, like sharing As problems thinking, is actually I was thinking more like, Wow, we, we need an impact right. Tinder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, like, here's my needs. And how can you help me fulfill my needs? Yeah. And you, talk about so, a, you talk about impact. Like if you have a, a many of all the problems in your town or local community or local population and other people can help you solve them. But if, if I'm thinking only my problems that are surrounding me are the only problems in the world, which is 
how most humans think, then it's hard for me to innovate around the other people's problems. And if mm-hmm. you take a closer look at startup genome, that's what they're putting the emphasis on. It's the, the, the more thriving, small ecosystems in the world are the ones that are the more interconnected global at a global scale. Because the startups from a young age, not the, the founders' young age, but from their inception, the businesses will have an international network and they will be concentrating on international uh, logistics, supply chains, needs. So like, the, the, if they can apply it to another country, then it's easier to also scale in uh, other places in the world. So instead of focusing only on their local uh, That's market. That's right. That's right. So, hmm. so this could be applied to impact. <laughs> yeah. That, that brings up an interesting dilemma between thinking in terms of the big picture, those big problems in many places, but also as entrepreneurs, you know that you have to take small steps like the, the next step and the next That's step right. and the next step. So it, it also becomes an interesting thing that you need to navigate as a person when you're leading a project. Like I have this big picture. I realize that there's these big problems out there, but then how do I not get lost in the big picture? How do I then be able to focus on the very next thing that I need to do to make that happen? Hmm. Yeah, I, tough, huh? <laughs> but I think the, the bigger, the bigger the need, the bigger the market will be, the easiest it will be for the startups to find the right uh, collaborators, the right fundings, and, and, and the right clients at the end of the day. So if you're, like a startup needs to actually have a pain to solve. If it's not there, or if it's not painful enough, it's gonna be a nice project, maybe it's gonna last for a while, but at the end of the day, there won't be a business model strong enough to, to support it. So if we're looking at impact-led businesses, Actually, they're looking at pretty painful problems in the world, but they're, they're looking to tackle it in, at a different angle than just making a profit uh, in, in a way to answer it. So, so how can you use all the other, the, these different metrics that make sense and that can help the entrepreneur make the right choices? Because in order to leverage the full potential of a business model, if you, if you can provide the statistics about how you, you're going to improve um, health problems or, 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 or uh, earth problems, whatever problems, it doesn't have to be linked to making more profit for the, um, the shareholders. It's about if you have, you're having a more solid impact or you're redistributing the, 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 the wealth that you're creating, you're gonna have more supporters in ways that are sometimes non-economical, but people are still gonna support you and make your company thrive at, at uh, maybe you're gonna have less costs uh, you're going to be. You're going to have more volunteers worldwide that are going to get are that are going to be there to support your, yeah, your more, message. More your social product. capital, more good stuff being uh, sometimes even more valuable than money. Yeah, when you want to, well, we can see it actually with uh, COVID. All all the products are being you know showcased right now. It's not about making in, like they're not asking people to create these great businesses to make themselves richer at the end of the day it's in order to co- collaborate and help the world be a better place and 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 settle the case once once and for all for uh, of, uh, of COVID. Hmm. you pointed to something that was that made me think of the need i keep circling back to answer the the main question which is what does it take to be an impact entrepreneur uh, and you made me think of something that's important. You need to, uh, there's people out there who are very committed to the notion of positive impact and solving those big problems in our communities and in the region. And sometimes, and this has happened to me and to most of the people that I know that are impact focused, they tend to then focus too much on the impact and then they forget that they need a sustainable economic model that makes everything work. Because right. if you can't pay your power bill and your mm-hmm. Wi-Fi, then you can't make your amazing online uh, marketplace for vegan, fair trade goods work. And so you absolutely need to have in mind a solid uh, management idea or a business model. Uh, of course, it's going to evolve and it needs to be informed by the impact side. But if you don't have that part, then you can't also sustain because there needs to be a balance between impact and the business focus as well. 
was it a statement or do you want uh, us to uh, <laughs> comment on that? <laughs> no, I, that, that's like, this is what I'm thinking, but I, I would love to hear from your side. Well, it, it, I totally agree. It's, it, it's what we've been, I think, discussing for, yeah. for the last half an hour. It's a great way to, to, to sum it up. Uh, entrepreneurs that are looking to do an impact, have an impact. It's, it's not about like just focusing on the impact. It's about focusing on what will make, uh, what will make you capable of delivering that impact. And sometimes people think in, in terms of compromises and like, oh, uh, I won't be able to deliver 100% of my mission because uh, like I'm going to be, I, I won't be eco-energetic and I will be using too much fuel in order to go to this, this and there. I'll be using the plane. And, and so they're not focusing anymore on the big picture of what they're really trying to achieve that will take time and effort. They're concentrating too much on the little steps. So it's about having the right balance between the, the strategy of little steps. It's in order to like it's get out of in, it's getting you in the groove of something. And from actually doing something like the effectuation uh, uh, theories, you're going to be able of, of generating uh, new opportunities for your business. But it's not like the long-term way of looking at your business. You cannot just do little steps for like five years and achieve it. You also have to build the longer-term vision. And in order to do that, longer-term vision is the impact you want. But sure, you have to make sure that you, you, you have the, the financials, the, the fundamentals to make sure that you're going to be able to go through each phases. So by building these blocks and making sure that each little steps, uh, you, you do it uh, with profitability or, or you break even at least and without losing the, the, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger picture that at some points, what you want to achieve is, is, is like, uh, have a bit, a, a good social impact. Well, it's, it, you're going to be able to, I think, combine and, and make amend and make sure that you, you can go a long way. Um, you're going to put all the chances on your side because you won't run out of money. And even though maybe in the short term, you won't have that much impact as you want, you're going to be building sustainable ways economically. Uh, you're going to give yourself the means to achieve the longer term vision. So sometimes people do it the other way around. Start with impact and don't focus, like you said, on, on making sure that it's economically sustainable. Hmm. What do you guys think an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur needs to know or to have as a skill set to be able to be really good networkers? Because you mentioned before about the importance of being able to share problems, about building this international uh, community. What do people need to be able to do that? I, I have a, a theory in this, but I... I was, I was personally not a great networker. I am improving. I'm not saying the greatest, but not a great worker when I came out of my corporate life. And I think that the reason for that was because I saw, I saw networking as, as something I had to do or something that where I needed to extract value from the other person. And it just felt like a drag, you know? And so I think it, it finally clicked for me when I realized that I need to have empathy. I really to want I, what the moment you want to find out more about what the other person does as opposed to what tell them what you're doing then networking becomes really easy right it actually because you know it, it because in essence all you're doing is allowing other people to share their stories and and find out what other great people are doing and then eventually sometimes it works out that there's business opportunities but that's not what you go after you go after you know building a relationship and creating empathy and, and really finding out what other people are, are working on and what other people, finding interest in, in, in what other people are working on. Um, and so for me, that's, that's been a great, you know, it really changed my mindset and I see it in, in, in the ecosystem here. Uh, there's great events. Uh, there's an event here called Venture Cafe. And one of the reasons I really like it is it's, it meets every Thursday and they have set rules of engagement. You know, if you go to this event, mm -hmm. you can't sell anything. You can't, you know, you can't be selling your services or selling, you know, it's a networking event and it's been going on for, for many years. And what I really like about that is like, it, it sets the rules of engagement so that everybody goes with the right mindset, right? You go to a networking event thinking, okay, I'm not going to be able to sell, so I can't do this. So I'm just going to go there to figure out what other people are doing. And it sets you in that mindset. 
and it, it, I think it's an effective networking uh, mindset. Amen. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You put in a in a very good nutshell so many books and so many things about like how to make friends and influence people and how to network and blah blah. Nutshell. It's about caring for the person in front of you instead of speaking at people with yep. your idea. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I wonder if our politicians could do this. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you know what's, it, it, it's funny you said this because, you know, I find that in different ecosystems, set, these settings are harder to find than others, right? So Boston, because of the recent, it's, it's really been recent, like 10 years from now, the ecosystem has been developed, all these different places where this, you know, em, empathic conversations happen are very, you know, occur very often in, in multiple locations with different settings. I, 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 I wonder... In Latam, how often that happens, and I've seen it not happen too often personally, where where a CEO and a professor and a student and an entrepreneur are all in the same room, and nobody's selling or buying anything, and they're just talking about the projects. And I wonder how many things that happens in other ecosystems, and I wonder if that's some that's like that's a that's a clue to you know developing this very open you know, open ecosystems of innovation because the moment you find out or you're willing to find out what the professor is working on, what the student is working on, what the entrepreneur is working on, what the CEO is, is worried about, that's the moment where you start making those connections and you, and you find innovate and you find solutions to, to, to challenges, you know? Hmm. Emmanuel, you, you want to jump in? I have some uh. ideas, but... No, no, to me, it's, it's all about uh, opening up yourself to what others have to offer, what others have in, in terms of needs or, or potential. If you're as, as passionate about discovering what others have to, to offer and to give as to what you want to give out there, just allow other people to uh, share with you and you're going to be able to share back at some point. And like, I think... It's also the difference. I think we had a discussion with between sales and business development. Sales, it's all about like, w at the end of the day, I need to close something for myself, for my organization. But business development, it's about what uh, Oliver just talked about. It's building a relationship with others that's going to lead on to, uh, to some sales at some point or maybe something else. But it's something more, uh, I think, um, true and, and, and so business relationship out of, uh, of of real real life relationships it's easier to have a discussion with let's say a friend or a business friend than with a total stranger from from who you just want to have obtain like a hard sell so at the end of the day if it's hard for somebody to get into that mindset well try to try to think about how do you behave with the people you usually have around you and uh, your friends, your family, and when you get into a networking, um, uh, a networking event, just try to to be as smooth or as enthusiastic, and, and try to put yourself in the shoes of, of the person in front of you, because maybe that person is as scared or, or super shy as you, and maybe you want want to do the first jump in. And so, by offering that person the opportunity to present his or her project to you you're going to be opening up a lot of doors and, and that person is going to remember you after that, that networking event and he's going to get you uh, along. Mm. But anyway, that's, gonna... that's what Oliver just mentioned. But again, in, in less words than I did. So. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when you speak, Emmanuel, even if, if it's a, a reiteration of what Oliver said, it expands. So that's amazing. You made <laughs> oh, so many different things right now. Uh, you made me think about how um, on the one side, you mentioned like, oh, this is development and sales, like they're different, different goals. Uh, and it's like, I feel like, yes, and yes, no. on the surface, no, in the, in the deeper way, because at least good sales, sales that, that make the other side feel good, not, not gimmicky sales, are also about building a relationship. And um, so this led me to think as you were speaking about how the type of stuff that we need as a region or as you as an individual entrepreneur making a project 
or, or as a company, you need to think of the networking as you're making roots. So to build roots in a community. So networking events, what they do is they connect you to others. And if you're not selling, as you said, Oliver, you don't, you don't go with the attitude of I'm going to go pitch my stuff. I'm going to go listen. That means I'm going to learn. It means I'm going to be able to have new perspectives. It means that I'm going to be able to get to know other people. They're going to get to know me. They're going to ideally walk away with a good impression. But I'm also like building these uh, stronger or weaker bonds. And what that means is that as time goes by, more and more people know me. If I'm doing it right, more and more people trust me, which means that then I am more capable of selling my stuff but not because I'm manipulating people into buying my stuff or because I'm tweaking the, the clickbait things or the calls to action on my website, but because people know that I am some, someone or a company with credibility, with walking the talk. And that builds businesses that last, that builds uh, ecosystems or communities that last. And so that can build a, a tri-national relationship that really lasts because we have trust and we have a feeling of connectedness. So that is, that is so important. And that came from what Emmanuel was saying. Yeah, that's a great (laughs) point. And there's actually a a book. I can't remember who the author is, but it's called investors invest in lines, not in dots. And you think about the lines versus dots. I mean, you described this very perfectly a line, right? A continuous line of, of interaction between one person and maybe the ecosystem or, or, or other person. And that's really what it is. You generate trust over multiple interactions uh, where you're not necessarily selling. And an investor really raising capital is nothing but selling your company, right? So it's a sale job all the way. And, and it applies for raising capital, applies to selling your product. Uh, most people think in dots because that's the immediate, you know, this immediate uh, satisfaction of trying to pitch your idea, trying to get immediately money or, get, or sell your product. Uh, and they're not thinking in lines. And, and most people build trust and invest in lines, right? So. Mm, there's a, a line <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that speaks about how uh, it's not businesses making business with businesses. It's not the building making a business with the building. Like it's not Amazon building talking to Apple building. It's yeah. humans connecting with humans. And so that, that's, that requires a trust, the communication, the networking, the listening, the empathy, all these things that you've talked about. Hmm. That's really juicy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I just realized we are ten five past uh, past the hour. Um, so I, I want to be very mindful of you guys' time as well. I know you have, it's a Friday, there's work to be done and whatnot. So I don't know if you want to be. Oh, uh, you guys are working? (laughs) (laughs) What is this work thing? (laughs) So I don't know if you want to continue going for a few minutes or if you want to wrap up. How do you feel? I'm good up up until uh, 11.15. I don't know about Oliver. Yeah, same here. I got another call at 11.15. Perfect. So then we can maybe share some like final thoughts and then we can wrap this up. Um, so a few keywords that I've taken note of throughout our conversation. Uh, we've spoken about the importance of, well, first of all, a framework and the feeling of commitment to like a, not just profit, but the whole impact notion. So being aware of, for example, a framework like the SDGs or the B Corp approach or uh, whatever and coming from not just wanting to sell more and jump on the bandwagon but because it's something that matters to you as a person or a company. So we talked about this. We talked about the importance of collaboration, of being aware of the needs of your place and how each place has different needs. We spoke about striking a balance between the big picture, uh, the big scale of the problems and the little immediate things you can do, uh, the balance between impact and economic sustainability, the importance of networking, of sharing problems we spoke about uh sharing uh well about empathy and uh, being interested in the other person about the the wonderful example of this networking event where you network with the rule of 
you're not here to sell. You're here to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the importance of trust and learning about not thinking in dots but lines. So I think this is a pretty nutritious list of the things, the type of things you would need as an impact-focused person or business to thrive and to be able to make impact. If I may, I, I, I'll just say maybe it's not my closing statement. Maybe it will be. It's up to you guys to choose. <laughs> but, but to me, there's a generational shift. Uh, so the mindset of consumers, the, the mindset of new businesses that are being built out there, impact can become real leverage in order to help some businesses go through hard times or even differentiate themselves. So like just if, even if somebody is not impact driven, impact driven businesses are, I think are going to succeed more than uh, let's say more traditional businesses. But in a way, I think that a bit like a lot of things that we're taking for granted nowadays uh, in our post industrial era, like uh, just having access to technologies, having access to, food, not having to go and hunt for it or, or grow it. Like there's a lot of things we take for granted and impact because there are so many things that we've done, maybe not in the best interest of the earth or, or, or the best interest of the humankind. Uh, now we need to like um, speed up things and try to make, make up for it. But maybe in 50 years from now, maybe we'll, we'll have catch up to it and we won't need to say, this is a traditional business and this is an impact led business. It's just business. It's yeah. just business. Cause it's going to yeah. become more, a, a more normal thing. Like it's going to be part it's of, gonna the, be like, the DNA of any, any businesses. Yes. Yes. I love it. So that's what we're looking to, to achieve uh, on our hand here and, and with you guys, cause I want to talk later on with Oliver and uh, talk post COVID era, making more ties between uh, Mexico, Mexico and, and Boston and Montreal. There's things to be done there. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, I mean, I think I'll, I'll tie this up. I'll stick, to, I'll stick to my word empathy because I think it's such a, you know, there's a reason that AI models are the, the hardest thing to, to replicate uh, for a machine is, to, is empathy. And it's because, you know, it's, it, it involves a lot of complex thoughts. Uh, it, it involves putting yourself in the shoes of others and understanding what they're thinking and feeling. And if you can do that, you can put yourself in the shoes of a consumer or another population, another city, another country, then by doing that, you immediately open your mind and open your vision to what is possible. And so if you think about how can, as an entrepreneur, how can I make the most impact, put yourself in the shoes of others, put yourself in the shoes of, you know, Will this work in, in Canada? Will this work in the U.S.? Am I impacting the per Am I doing the thing that I think I'm, am I really impacting the person that I think I'm impacting? And so, if you have a lot of empathy in your in your relationships and in, in your business, I think you're going to have uh, a lot of impact. Hmm. I don't think I have anything more to add to that. <laughs> that was that was perfect for both of you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for being part of this, this conversation. Thank you guys. Thank you both of you. It's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure. And I'm sure we'll be having a lot of great conversations in the near future. Oh, yeah, for sure. Thanks for sharing this uh, all together and uh, looking forward to all these other podcasts. Keep, uh, keep the good themes and the good vibes going with. Thank you so much. And this is not the end of our conversation. <laughs> I'm sure there will be many more to come. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Have an amazing right, day. Thank you to the audience as well. Hope you get something good out of it. And I'll see you next time. Right. Peace.